want to welcome each and every single one of you to our service today, our sermon, and I pray and I trust that God will speak to you through His Word. We are busy with a series, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and I am excited to see what God wants to say to me, to you, and let's just pray and honor Him for who He is. Father Lord, we pray to You, we honor You for who You are. Lord, You are on the throne of our lives. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that You will be and around us, that You will that we will encounter you, that we will see you. Lord, I pray that each and every single son and daughter of yours will receive what they need to receive by the precious name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that your angels will be around us, that you will protect us all the way in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome, if you are looking and watching this today in your personal capacity, whether you're a family or whether you're a group gathering, even in Pakistan, may this word be a blessing to you. So we are busy with a series, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the first time I've done a series like this. And um, I always used to say in Bible, in Bible school, I used to say major on the major, minor on the minors. And um, it is so rich and enriching for me to be able to study the book of Revelation and make it practical in our lives. And it's so important in this time and day that we find ourselves in. So the first week we said that the main theme of the book of Revelation is that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being the center of all things. Jesus being the center of the church. The seven churches talking about the fullness of the church. The seven spirits before the throne of God talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And how each church looks different but each section of the church speaks to every church. And in the first week we talked about return to your first love and how Jesus was complimenting them on the things that they've been doing that was good and saying well done my good and faithful servant but this I've got against you so Jesus is always complimenting and telling, telling them what they're doing good but then he brings it to the debit side like a book a balanced book credit debit debit side is saying but I've got this against you return to your first love and how being morally sound and doctrinally sound and doing the right thing um, doesn't replace having a heart on fire and burning for Jesus having a passion for Jesus Christ the second week was being persecuted and how the Lord um, loves it, how, how His people stand strong even in the times of persecution. And how the enemy can persecute us in areas of our lives. And that that persecution becomes a test and becomes part of a testament in our lives. But this week, uh, my sermon is titled, Compromise, No Compromise on the Word of God. And I pray that it will bless you. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was the pastor of the church in Pergamum, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality so also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans therefore repent if not I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it such an amazing piece of scripture. We're going to get into it and just break it open. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you today as God is speaking to His church, even globally in South Africa at this point in time, in the, in the season we find ourselves in. So my first subtitle is the Word of God. And we all know about the Word of God. But it's important that wherever we find ourselves, we have a final authority. We have something that we measure against. There's something, a law it's called the Word of God. It's Jesus in print. John 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is the final authority. What Jesus said, what the Bible says, teaches us how to live and establishes us in God, in our relationship with God. So in Revelation chapter 2 verse 12, it says, The words of Him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you and soon war against them with the sword of my mouth, Jesus speaking. And in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, a scripture that most of us know, let's just dig into it. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Amazing. When we read the scriptures like a mirror, you know, we, um, if we're children of God, the things that we're not doing, what we're not supposed to be doing, quickly gets exposed when we read the Bible, is it not? In any case, the word is living and active. I'm going to concentrate on a few words in the scripture just so that we understand it correctly. Active, living, we've already said Jesus in print, living and active. But active, the Greek word there is energies, and it comes from the word argon, which means actively working and actively talk, uh, toiling. Toiling meaning working extremely hard. Now in Philippians 1 verse 6, the Bible says, And I am sure of this, Paul speaking, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And that's talking about the word of God that we accept when we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We receive the truth. We repent from our sin, sins. We receive the Holy Spirit. We start to live according to the word of God. That word of God that's working and actively toiling inside of you. That changes you so that we will be perfect one day when we're with Christ. Until then, God has got a lot of work to do in some of us. In me, a lot of work. But be... Uh, be encouraged in this that God will complete that work as long as we hold fast to the faith so that's the word active its work means working very hard then we come to the word sharper sharper than a two-edged sword the Greek word there is tomateros it sounds almost like tomatoes tomatoes and it means to cut in a clean single stroke right to the place where it's supposed to cut to so I don't know if you've ever heard of the word Bible bashing technically that's impossible because the Bible is not blunt. The Word of God is not blunt. Actually, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged. That word two-edged means, the Greek word there is stono. Um, and it means, it means a double-mouthed sword. The Word of God, the mouth of God, the double-mouthed sword, the double-edged sword, is not something that's blunt or that you need to bash somebody with. When Jesus speaks a word, He knows exactly what He's speaking to your life, into my life, into the church. And He cuts with a single stroke right clean to the place where it needs to cut to that's the word of god the word that blessed me in the scripture was let's just read it again for the word of god is living and active sharper than any to its short piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and matter right into that place where it needs to go and here's the word that's going to bless you and discerning discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart now that word discerning the greek there is kritikos and the base word for that kritikos is krino now, crit criticos means critical, critical to be critical thinking or critical towards something, according to something, because we've got a view. Now, the crino and criticos means a judge, like in a court, that's trying a case, discerning, deciding, condemning, or punishing. So, the word of God that is discerning, the word of God is like a judge in a court, and we come in front of that court with our lives and the things that we do. And the word of God tries us. That's what the Bible teaches us. It judges us according to what we have done according to the word of God. Amen. So I know in some churches we say that we're not supposed to judge people. I'm going to get there. But we don't have to judge people because the word of God is the judge of our lives and of our behaviors. God can see everything. And the word of God is like a mirror to me and you. We see ourselves and we know what's wrong and what's right. In any case, for those that think we're not supposed to judge people in the church, let's just look at the context of that. Because for the compromising church, it's something that we need to address and do it in a loving way. But we have to do it. If we don't do it, we'll be compromising on the word of God. So, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, he says, For what I have to do with judging outsiders, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Is he talking about the person? No, he's talking about the behavior. We don't condemn the person. We judge according to the word of God that's actually doing the judging. We don't say what's right and wrong. The word of God says what's right and wrong. People's behavior. And then he says in verse 13, God judges, God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That's what Paul says. He actually says don't even eat with such a person. The sexually immoral and all of those. Any case, and the greedy. Um, that's the word of God. So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, so the word God is coming with the word of God. It's specifically talking to this church about the word of God. You'll remember in the first week that we spoke, with the last return to the, to the first love, there was an opening statement of Jesus dwelling and walking among the churches. 
uh, uh, the return to the first love because Jesus watches. The second week, it was Jesus being the resurrected one. Then he was talking about the persecuted church. But in this section of the church he's addressing, he's introducing himself as the one who's got the double mouth, double edged sword that comes from his mouth, the word of God. So it's important that the word of God is the standard that we live to. Now, here comes the compromise and the, the contrast, the things that we find ourselves in every day in, in our lives. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 13, it says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, where he's, where he's being worshipped. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas. Antipas was the, was the pastor of the church of Pergamum. My faithful witness who was killed among you, he was burnt in a brass bull. They might take an empty brass bull, they empty it on the inside, make a hollow place there for a human being to fit into, then make fire under the brazen bull, and they burn the person to death, and the smoke comes out of the nostrils, and the sounds coming out, it sounds like a bull. And then they take all kinds of incense to try and take the smell away. But that's how this pastor died. You remember the previous pastor of the previous church also died. He was thrown into, uh, set on fire, he didn't die from the fire and the oil. Then they took weapons and they killed him. The persecuted church. This was the non-compromising. You see the place where um, Jesus was dwelling. Let me first read it. But I have a few things against you. You have some that you hold to the teaching of Balaam. Who, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat the food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Remember last week I spoke to it. Next week's sermon, there's always mention, also mention of it. Um, but let's, let's just get into this. So the place where Satan's throne was, was the place of idol worship. The word Pergamum means comes from the word citadel. And it's actually parchments that they used to write on. So that was the, the main city where um, the temple of Zeus was, the, the god of healing with a snake. And they actually had a temple there where if you wanted healing, you had to go and sleep on the temple floor. And they had all these hundreds of snakes crawling over you. And then they, the snakes infuse you with their power. Now, I don't know about you, but the first, the first snake I see sailing coming towards me, I'll either be kicking it or running in the separate direction. But... Uh, I think they were very brave. They were just not very, uh, very clever, maybe. But in any case, this is the stuff that was happening. This was, Pergamum was also the first uh, city, main city of, of Rome, that uh, erected the temple for the worship of Caesar. Now, Caesar worship was very pertinent at that point in time. Now, I just want to make this practical because Caesar worship, Caesar worship represents government worship. It represents constitution worship. Where something that's contrary to the word of God is put at a place where it's being worshipped and being obeyed and being adhered to, not according to the word of God. Amen. So this is what Caesar worship represents. It means like if the world says that something is right and the Bible says it's wrong and we adhere to what the world says, that's, that's Caesar worship in a sense if I can just make it practical because Caesar represents governing authority, constitution, obeying of rules. Now obviously Caesar took it a bit far, but I think maybe today some, in some instances we're also taking it a bit too far in the world. But in any case, we do what we do in love, we, we do it in the right way and in God's way because Jesus in the Bible teaches us how to deal with all of these things. Always being a light, always being a light, even praying and helping and being a shining example to the world. So that's what's, what's going on in Pergamum. Now, we need to get into the teaching of Balaam. This is quite tricky. Now, remember, it's talking about the compromising church. So, Jesus was telling them on the, on the balance sheet, credit side, debit side, credit side, they were holding fast to his name. They were not denying Christ. They were holding fast to his name. They were not denying Christ. But on the debit side, he was saying, listen, you guys are holding fast to my name. But in this church, in this segment of people, in the area in the, uh, that you find yourselves in, this I've got against you. And I think we as the church need to listen to what God is saying to this segment of the church because if Jesus thought it important to speak in that time, Jesus finds it important to speak in this season. What is the teachings of Balaam? Now, for those of you who don't know, Balaam was a prophet. In a sense, he was a little bit like a witch doctor that we, we get to know today because he used magic to foretell and he was like a bit of mixed uh, religions. And he, what he did, he did for money also. So he got paid. People hired him to, to pronounce a curse or pronounce a blessing. Now, this is exactly what the king of Moab, Balak, did. He hired Balaam to curse Israel. When Israel was on the way through the land of Moab, um, 
to Canaan. He got them on a high mountain and you're going to go read the story. There were three places where we hired him to curse Israel. And each time Balak blessed him. So remember, uh, the enemy cannot, cannot curse you because God blesses. And he cannot bring anyone to put a curse on you because Jesus is inside and in our lives. But here's the thing that they can do. Now, this is what, what Balaam did. For the love of money, now I want you to understand this. There was some point where Balaam actually asked God. So, in his mind, Balaam, the prophet of God, the person of God, um, but he was actually mi mixing it up with all kind, kinds of different things. He was already compromised, in a sense. But in his mind, he didn't, he, he didn't think he was compromised. He had one motive, two motives, three motives that I'm going to get into now. And this is something that we as a church needs to be careful of. So, the enemy cannot curse you. He cannot. But he can put a stumbling block in front of you that causes you to stumble and not fully inherit what God has got for you. Amen. It's very important that we discern this. So the enemy cannot curse you. The enemy cannot kill you. Um, I'm not talking about if you're irresponsible and you go do stuff that you're not supposed to do and jump off a bridge 300 meters high because you're high, then you're gonna, probably going to get killed. But I mean, uh, the reality of the matter is, as we as Christians, the enemy can't kill you, he can't curse you, but he uses stumbling blocks. Now let's look at the teaching of Balaam, and it's very important that we take note of what's happening here. In the ministry, in people teaching or giving sermons anywhere, it's easy to be deceived. And I want to say this, if you think you cannot be deceived, you're deceived already. It's very important that we keep, and held, uh, keep ourselves accountable to the Word of God, accountable to people that God puts around us. I am accountable to some people in my life, actually to each, any person that comes to me according to the Word of God. We have to be accountable to the Word of God. So what Balaam did was, Balaam had a problem and he had a fear of man more than he, than he had the fear of God. And that already compromised him because to him it was more important what people thought and what he would do. The first thing was then the fear of man. His reputation was, was, was at stake. The second thing, Balaam did what he did for money. So he was paid once, and <laughs> then he blessed. He was paid a second time, then he blessed. Paid a third time. But because of his love of money, he wanted Balak, the king of Moab, to keep on paying him. And that's where from his side, from his own side, he went and told them about a stumbling, putting a stumbling block in front of Israel. So he did it for money. We have to be sensitive, and I'm, I'm just going to call it as it is. So the first thing that the teaching of Balaam, to make it practical today, as if we care more about the, the, our reputations and the fear of man than we care about what God thinks about us and um, our fear of God. That's very, very important. The second thing is the love of money. Now, the Bible teaches us that we cannot love God and money. Now, here's the thing, and I think I touched on this last week as well. Be careful of the teachings that you listen to because if we're using a Christian motive and our end goal is money, it is talking about the love of money. If we, our end goal is Christ and we're giving or obeying or sowing or doing whatever is biblical, but our end goal is Christ, then it's a love of God. But be careful because people can, can deceive, people that's already deceived, teach some of this stuff that the end goal is money and we teach Christian things, but the end goal is money. It's, it's, that's false teaching. That is actually the love of money. And a lot of times, People that are deceived in that area, they don't even know that they are deceived. And I'm not going to go into, um, uh, into too much detail into that. The fact of the matter is today, you get a book and they say the seven keys to success. What is the end goal? Success. The seven things we're going to do for? Success. So whatever you're pursuing in your life, I want to ask you what the end goal is. Is the end goal Christ or is the end goal money? Um, Jesus was not concerned about the political sh situation in Jerusalem. I just want to say it as it is. He didn't have a lot to say. Actually, he said, pray for them, obey them, all of that. I found Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. It didn't make sense to the people of Israel. And a lot of people rejected him because what Jesus came to do didn't fit in with what they wanted Jesus to do. We need to be sensitive today especially in our country or any country in the world, we, we are so praying to God for certain outcomes. 
we must make sure if that outcome is God's out wanting to an outcome or our own underlying fears of what we want God to do in our lives. So the Bible teaches us, our Father that is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not Lord, my will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, today, dependence, our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we give others their sins. Please protect us from the evil one and do not lead us into temptation. So the first one for teaching of Balaam was the fear of man, the reputation. Second was, was the love of money. The third one was sexual immorality. The Greek for sexual immorality is pornea. The Greek for fornication is pornea, porno. You can go look at it. Any sexual immorality has got to do with uh, pornography. Um, all different types, the different levels of it. That's how they caught, that's how he caught Israel. That's how with intermarriage, because he knew and God knew, that's why God told Israel not to intermarry with other nations. Why? It will lead them to worship other gods. Israel was called to be holy. Holy means to be set apart and to set aside. We are set apart for God because we live according to the word of God and not according to the world. And we set aside the things of the world because we are Christians. So the Bible teaches us in Matthew 5 verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. It means we are in the earth, but we are not from the world. We're not the same salt. We are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, become the same as the sand. How shall its saltiness be restored if it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet like sand? People don't trample under salt, they trample under sand. But salt is useful. Salt, salt can be used some, some places. It says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But understand that it gives light to all that is in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. We are set apart. We as Christians, like salt, we set aside the things of the world. That's why there's light. Because if you're under a basket, nobody can see you. It means you're looking exactly the same like the world. And I believe that in compromise, if we start, if the church starts to look exactly like the world, with things that we accept, we are compromising and we're losing our saltiness and we're losing our light. Do we have to do everything to bring people in? I believe we must do what we can do to bring people into the office. But that does not mean compromising to the to the world you know today it's become so acceptable for people living together sleeping together first checking if this is the right one to be married um, i'm calling it because this is something that i believe is compromised on because it's not according to the word of god yeah but everybody does it who are you to say it no it's wrong the bible says fornication and sexual um before marriage is wrong it's just it's not god's way it's as simple as simple as that and there's no compromise it, it says greediness is wrong to love money more than you love god or to throw people under the bus for money is wrong it's not right it's god's it's not it's not uh, um it's not moved by that at all and i want to say this because i believe in that we've we've come to a place where we don't say anything about anyone anymore because we're so scared and who are we to judge and we are busy compromising. I'm not saying, I want you to hear my heart today. God loves people. God builds into people. But God's word is the light and the life of our lives. If we compromise, we are slowly choking to death. I want to say this. If you're compromising in areas, it will take the life out of you. It will squeeze you like a python snake. It will squeeze you. It will take the life out of you until you get to that place where you repent. Now, Solomon was the wisest man in the world. The wisest man and he still went and served other gods at the end of the at the end of these days why because sexual immorality because he had many more than i don't know how many wives he had a lot and concubines it took him to a place where he worshiped other gods solomon that was the wisest man that means there's something about um, um uh, sexual immorality that takes away all wisdom that's the reality of the matter David, when he was walking on the roof and he sees something that, that he was not supposed to see, when he look at, looks at something that he was not supposed to look at, loses all his marbles, goes off the rails, adultery, murder, and he only comes back to God when he repents and turns away from it. And I want to say this. 
sexual immorality, no matter what form, it will, it will destroy areas in your life and it will make things difficult. When Balaam, the teaching of Balaam, the love of money, fear of man, sexual immorality, of these three things, that stumbling blocks the enemy uses to put before me and you. Let's not fall into that and Jesus addresses that. I'm not going to go into the teaching of the Nicolaitans that much because I went into that last week. But that talks about license to sin. It talks about grace. It talks about the fact that Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary and that he did. But it doesn't call people to repentance. That is the, the, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So the first one was the teaching of Balaam compromising. The second one was um, uh, living a license to sin lifestyle with no call to repentance. Now the Bible and Jesus, whenever he spoke in the New Testament, and even when he's speaking to the churches and the different parts of the churches, he's calling them to repent of certain things, each and every single church. He's complimenting them and he's calling them to repentance. That's why in our kingdom prayer, we are praying that us forgives us every single day. We repent from the things. That's why we come to, to salvation and then there's a daily a daily repentance of what God wants to do in our lives. And I just want to go into the following in 2 Corinthians, the, one of our key uh, last type titles to repent. Therefore repent, if not I will come soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. And this was quite interesting to me because it's talking again with the word of God. Now look what happens in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8. When Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church that was compromising in all these areas. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8, Paul speaking, For even if I made you grief with my letter, for even if I made you grief with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I Paul felt bad. I slightly felt bad. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But also what eagerness to clear, clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness might be revealed to you in the sight of God. And I want to ask you, in us coming to repentance, it's not only about what we did wrong. It's also showing God that we want to honor Him and please Him. If there's anything in our lives that is not um, bringing honor to Him, I'm closing with the last part and it's called the reward. In Revelation 2 verse 17 it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. And 2 Timothy 2 verse 5 is talking about Paul talk, talking about the race. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So, um, this white stone that Paul, uh, that Jesus is speaking to John about, the Romans received a white stone when they won the race. Um, I've, I've, I did a bit of research. So you can receive the white stone or the reward or the crown where Jesus says, well done my good and faithful servant. When you compete according, when you compete according to the rules. 1 John 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't it amazing? If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. I want to say to you that Jesus found it very important to speak to the church that compromises in certain areas that the enemy uses to put stumbling blocks in front of us. We have to stand for the truth in love. We don't judge. God judges through His Word already the people inside the church. I believe that repentance, when we come to back to God with our lives first, that's something that God wants, wants to do. 
that's something that brings forth a revival. But first, let's seek and repent to the one that we've turned away. Let's repent to the one that's calling us to repentance. Why? Because it's putting a stumbling block between you and Jesus, between your relationship. It's stealing your joy. It's killing your passion. It's slowly choking you, choking you, choking you, choking you. And the Holy Spirit, it might, not, it might even be something that the Holy Spirit revealed to you as I was busy ministering. But I want to pray that for now, I'm going to close, I want to pray that we will be the salt and the light. I want to pray that we repent from compromise. I want to pray that God will forgive us and that we will live the lives that we are called to live. Let's just close our eyes. Father, I pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that each and every single son and daughter of yours that has listened to this message, Lord, you've spoken to their hearts. Lord, they know what the areas of compromise is. Lord, you are calling them in love to repentance. And I pray that there where you are now, if that is you, I want you to pray with me. You can go pray later on and just have a personal relationship with God. Speak to Him. But just pray with me. Say, Father, forgive me for I've compromised in areas in my life. Just name the areas there where you are. Just name it. Just name it and talk to God. Lord, forgive me my sins. Thank you that you are faithful, that you forgive us our sins when we come to you. Lord, thank you that we can come with confidence to the throne of grace that the blood of Jesus forgives us all sins. Lord, help me to not only change my mind about this, about compromise, but help me change not my mind and my actions that I will keep on the road of no compromise according to your word. Then, Lord, I pray that I will be the salt, I will be the light, that you will be the salt, that you will be the light, and that you will live the life that God called you to live in the mighty name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray God's goodness over you. I pray God's favor over you. And may His mercy follow you all the days of your life. Remember, He is the King of Kings. He loves you very much. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. But for you to reach God's full plan for you, we cannot afford to compromise. For too long in our lives, David compromised and affected his life. God has given us His word. Let's grab and hold on to Jesus as he has taken hold of us. May God bless you and may he keep you. Amen.